First and foremost, I believe that for any physician to be effective, he or she must take the time to understand who it is we're trying to help. And Dr. Bergen touched on, on some of this, but let me, let me go over it in a bit more detail. Dr. Eric Cassell, an internist and bioethicist, has this to say. Unlike other objects of science, persons cannot be reduced to their parts in order to better understand them. Yet it is useful in understanding the relation between suffering and the goals of medicine to look at a simple topology of persons. Dr. Cassell reminds us that a person has a family and a past. A person has roles. A person has a cultural background that contributes to beliefs and values that can play a part in the effects of disease. A person has a relationship with himself or herself. Persons do things in the world. Each of us has a secret life. Sometimes it takes the form of fantasies and dreams of glory, and sometimes it has a real existence known only to a few. Everyone has a transcendent dimension, a life of the spirit, however expressed or known. Every person has a perceived future. Hope is one of the necessary traits of a successful life. Every person has a body and a mind. Disease can so alter the relationship that the body and mind is no longer seen as a friend, but as an untrustworthy enemy. Dealing with human obsolescence and frailty, sickness and disease and decline, and the personality of idiosyncrasies and behaviors that predate the illness or result from it, not to mention the family dynamic that is unique to each individual circumstance. Well, this is what it is, what to me is what doctoring is all about. And I found that to deal and negotiate effectively in these often fraught and difficult realms, one of them gave us a call on philosophy or psychology, on religion and literature, rather than just science. There are no algorithms, flowcharts, tables, or graphs to guide the way. To be effective, one must have an innate empathic responsiveness, a learned patience, an attitude of humility, a stance of honesty, and a willingness to reflect on one's failures in order to do better the next time. And what else does one do? As a doctor, when one sits down with someone, a stranger who met for the first time, someone sick or in pain or worried or heartbroken or depressed, someone who is suffering, I make a connection with that person. I'm establishing a relationship one day to a mutual understanding, respect, and trust. What does that mean to the patient before me? What does it mean that I'm giving this time and asking these questions about his life, or family, or background, or work life, personal habits, faith? It means that I care enough to ask, that I want to understand that particular individual, that I'm looking for clues within this person's life in order that I might help ease her pain and suffering, make a correct diagnosis. Formulate a plan to help, maybe even cure. But this is not enough. It's delineated by the four principles of medical ethics that Dr. Bergeron touched on. Autonomy, which, is in a, which in a free society puts the ultimate decision-making power into the hands of the patient or a legally appointed surrogate decision-maker. Non-maleficence admonishes physicians as to what we must not do as professionals or stated another way, as it is in the Hippocratic Oath, first, do no harm. Justice, the fair allocation of scarce resources, operates on a higher plane than the doctor-patient relationship, and while all of us have a responsibility to work to change the paradigm when need be, in the main, these justice issues are ultimately societal and legal ones. Beneficence, which can also be defined as doing the right thing, the kind thing, the compassionate thing, for that individual unique human being that comes for help is the ethical principle that requires a positive emotional investment on the part of a medical professional as we teach our medical students here and as Dr. Bergeron mentioned at this center we must be able to imagine the patient's experience imagine the patient's experience this is our mantra as physicians we must be patient we must be present must give of ourselves and of our time. No matter the hour, our level of fatigue, the turmoil in our personal life, our own needs at the moment, 
We must reach deep inside to the well of empathic responsiveness, the idealism that we know is there, that essence of humanness that brought us into medicine in the first place. As long as human doctors minister to human patients, the intuition and the empathic responsiveness required to successfully negotiate the doctor-patient relationship will be a cornerstone of medical care in the wisdom that my colleagues, the Rinpoche and the rabbi, on this panel tonight bring to our discussion and our ongoing self-analysis and self-discovery are essential to this process. Thank you very much. Should I just leave this here? Is that, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff up here in the computer with all kinds of pictures. I don't know whether I'm supposed to appreciate it, but it looks great. <laughs> Thank you all very much. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, the way my understanding is that the purpose of this conference is to situate suffering within the context of, the perspe of three perspectives. First and foremost, within the perspective of the practice of medicine. And then in clarifying and evaluating Western and Eastern religious approaches. That at least is my understanding of what we're doing. Now, what does disease mean to a person? A doctor has to somehow ask and answer that question. And um, how does a person who is ill integrate this illness into his or her sense of self? And my point of view here uh, is to somehow ask and answer the question of how can religion provide a context within which such an integration can take place. Now, as I understand my responsibility, it is to provide the perspective of the Western approaches. Now, let's be clear, to speak about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, which is the, the approaches I'm supposed to be discussing within the context of 15 minutes is not going to be not only difficult, it's impossible. It's impossible not only because of the limitations of time, but even more so, it's impossible because of my personal limitations. I'm in no sense an expert, really, in any of these three religions. Even within Judaism, I only have uh, some deep knowledge within one small aspect of it. But if we were to look at what the Western world is, the Western world is a product of a number of spiritual and intellectual resources. It's not just Greece and Rome, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. And all these traditions have much to say, and there's a vast literature when it comes to what they have to say about suffering. Now, my definition of suffering, because I think if we're gonna be talking about suffering, let's at least agree on some definition. And here there may be an issue as to whether this is a definition that would be universally accepted. But I would define suffering as that which hinders the full realization of the true or authentic self in an authentic society which is organized to bring about such a realization. So that suffering isn't just an individual thing. It isn't just whether I'm in pain or not in pain, whether I'm fulfilled or not fulfilled, but whether I have some contact with that which makes me authentically me, and do I fulfill that, and am I in the context, in a social context, where such a fulfillment is possible? Now, from a Jewish perspective, and here I would say we have similarities in both Christianity and Islam, and I'll say some words about that presently. Suffering comes from trying to realize a false or inauthentic self. That is, doing what is destructive to oneself. And suffering comes from doing often not the wrong thing, not the destructive thing, but suffering also takes place from doing the right thing. Now that's a very interesting paradox. Why is it that suffering also comes because there is unconscious mechanical suffering and there's conscious, self-conscious suffering? Now, let me try to illustrate that by telling 
a midrash about Moses. Now, a midrash is a rabbinic way in which they try to make a point. The story is told that Moses, who had gone through the wilderness, freed the, uh, the people of Israel, the Israelites from Egypt, and one of the kings who really have heard about Moses, he sends his most famous portrait artist, and he says, make a portrait of Moses, and when we look at that portrait, we will then be able to bring that portrait to the physiocrats, and the physiocrats will use their science to tell us what Moses was, what made him such a great leader, what made him such a great hero. So the fellow goes, he makes this portrait, and he comes back, and the physiocrats have their way at it, and they come to the following conclusion. Moses is dogmatic, he's arrogant, he's selfish, he's angry, he's hot-tempered, he's vicious. In, in other words, he's no good. <laughs> he can't believe it. So what does he do? He then himself goes to see Moses as he says to Moses, I can't believe it. The portrait is accurate. It's exact. And the physiocratic uh, science is, is, is certainly true. So how can you explain it? And he says, I'm even worse than what your physiocrats have said. He says, I am selfish. And he says, no, that can't be, the king says. After all, how can you be selfish when, when Joshua said to you, don't you see these people are prophesying, that they're taking your place? And didn't you say, would that all God's children be prophets? He says, yes, that's true, I did say that. And isn't it true when, uh, when the children of Israel were ready to go back to Egypt and say, we're going to captain, and they started stoning you, and, and I said, I'll make a great nation out of you, a great nation out of you, and I'll destroy them. He says, wait a minute, you can't do that, because you're a God who keeps his promises. Isn't it true, this king says to him, that when you were ready to land, go into the promised land, you were unhappy because God brought you out of Egypt to take you into the promised land? He wouldn't let you enter. And didn't you say, I understand why I cannot enter, because by entering, the children of Israel would remain children and never grow up. So how can you say to me that you're even worse? And he says, let me tell you something. The hardest thing that I've ever had to do is to confront the worst in myself and overcome it. To confront the worst in myself and overcome it. See, there's suffering that you do because we do stupid things, we do silly things, we do selfish things. But there's also suffering that comes from doing the right thing. Isn't it interesting? When you have the prophets of Israel Take Jeremiah, for example, or Amos, or Isaiah, or any of them. They say, seek good and not evil that you may live. That's what Amos says. So what did they do to Amos? They kicked him out. <clears throat> Look at, they imprisoned Jeremiah. So the question that dawns on us, that there's also suffering because we do the right thing. It is by trying to make ourselves better because we have to look at the worst in ourselves, and also we have to make the world better. Because from a Jewish perspective, this is an unfinished world. Now, let me tell you, the great sage Hillel put it very well. He says, if I'm, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? But if I'm only for myself, what am I? Now, I think in a way that's very true, because most of us say that the most important thing is to be selfless and try to be good to others. When in reality, we have to stand for ourselves. But most people misunderstood what Hillel really meant. Let me tell you what I think he meant. He meant the following. He said, if I'm not for myself, and this is very interesting. He says, perhaps, a quote, uh, a sage said that what Hillel meant was that perhaps one of the most embarrassing and disconcerting experiences that anyone can have is when a person is counted on to do something of importance or when we're in a predicament where we were counted upon and asked to fulfill a task and we were not up to it for lack of self-preparation. We didn't think enough of ourselves to be able to prepare ourselves to really stand up and be counted. And so therefore what happens is you feel guilty. And there's two kinds of guilt, two kinds of guilt. There's guilt which is experienced when I'm called on by another and another makes a demand on me that I recognize the legitimacy of that demand 
and I failed to respond. When someone counts on me and I didn't do the right thing and I feel guilty. But there's another kind of guilt and that is when I lead my life and I wake up one day and discover that I never really did much with it. That God gave me a soul. God gave me a divine spark and I missed. I failed to be fully and really myself. There's a wonderful story about Rabbi Susio. He says when he was ready to die, he was crying. And the disciples say, how could you be crying? You are a saint. You're a wonderful person. He says, when I die and go to heaven, God isn't going to ask me, why weren't you Moses? Or why weren't you Joshua? Why weren't you Akiba? He's going to ask me, why weren't you Susio? And what does it mean? It means that when a person dies on judgment day, he will have to account in a very specific way. What did you do? You who had the power to ameliorate so much pain and didn't do it. You who had the power to rectify the evils in the world and didn't do it. Now that's suffering of a different nature. There's this sad, profound feeling that I've missed it. Now, the point that I want to make here is this, that if a person who feels that their life has been fulfilled engages in, a, has a disease, or is troubled, or has a loss, or goes through the whole agony that doctors deal with, if a person feels that their life has meant something, that they have loved and they have been loved, that they have been understood. You see, most people think that people want to be praised. That's not true. What people really want is to be understood. They want to know that there's someone there who really knows them from within. But if they've lacked that, then disease can be a terrible, terrible, terrible experience. Because I would say that it's the religious context within which makes one capable of understanding what that disease will do to you. And so my own fundamental approach to this is that we have to actually find a way in which we can be in touch with our creativity, which that which makes us fully human, which that which makes, which actualizes the true self, the soul of a person. And by actualizing that soul of a person, then perhaps we can face and confront that disease, whatever the disease may be whatever the pain may be, whatever the suffering may be, with a sense of hope, with a sense of trust, with a sense that there's an ultimate meaning to life and to the world. If you don't believe that, you have a real problem. Because then, life is a tale told by an idiot in Shakespeare's words, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Judaism believes that one should never cure one's own hurt by hurting others. On the contrary, one should cure one's own hurt by helping others. And isn't it true, the very people who have done the best of people who have suffered. I have a friend who died because he, was, uh, uh, he had uh, uh, a disease that ravished him. So what did he do? He built a center, the Columbia University Diabetes Center, which has become a state-of-the-art center. He wasn't bitter. He said, what ravishes me, I have to do what I can to help others who suffered like me. And perhaps the worst thing that can happen to a person is a person who feels that he's not worthy <coughs> or merits being dependent on. There's a rabbinic statement, and I'll conclude with this. There's a rabbinic statement that says, if a man has two cows, one strong and one weak, who is he going to put the burden on? On the strong or on the weak? Well, the answer is pretty clear. He's going to put the burden on the strong. And the great tragedy, it seems to me, is that there aren't that many people who will take upon themselves this burden because perhaps the sentiment gradually established itself that the mark of the grandeur of a human being is to be asked to bear more than his share of the burden. And by the same token, 
The supreme degradation of the low and the base is to be taught not worthy, not worthy of being ennobled through bearing the sins and sorrows of others. In this sense, I think, that the Jewish tradition establishes a base which is built upon in the Christian tradition. In a way, it's different because the emphasis is different. But you see, what Christianity, as I understand it, and I teach in a Catholic school for 16 years, I've taught in, uh, at St. Thomas Aquinas University. But from what I've been able to understand it, what Christianity says is, a God who simply promises redemption cannot engender the same depths of conviction as a God who not only promises, but as it were, delivers through incarnation and resurrection. You see the difference? In Judaism, the, the great, great prophet takes on the suffering, but not the guilt. Whereas what you have in Christianity is something radically different. What you have in Christianity is where through the incarnation, you have a human being, God becoming a human being, who then takes on the guilt, not just the suffering. And this is a difference. It's a fundamental difference between Judaism and Christianity. In Judaism, we believe that each individual takes on the guilt, his own guilt, and has to find his own redemption. In Christianity, you have it. Secondly, I would say that you have a different concept of judgment day. Because as I said before, in the Jewish tradition, judgment means basically that you are judged, but you have a chance to say, you know, you have a chance to render an account of yourself. It almost, it's like a dialogue with God. And uh, in the Muslim tradition, it's very interesting. A judgment day in the Muslim tradition is where all and final justice takes place. Namely, God's justice will be fully and finally shown. And that basically is that every time we are tested, and from the Muslim point of view, we are continually tested, we have to somehow pass that test. So in conclusion, let me say that the Jewish tradition basically affirms that God is behind everything. God creates everything. God gives us a soul. God gives us the possibility to realize that soul through free will. And in trying to do that, we make a lot of mistakes, but we have an opportunity yearly on Yom Kippur, which we just separately, recently celebrated it, to come to terms with who we are and to be a different person. Each one of us has the opportunity to change. So in a sense, the Jewish tradition is both tragic and prophetic. Tragic because, yes, we have some infirmity, some flaw that may do us in, but it's not over. We can also look at that flaw. We can look at that infirmity and become a different person, become a new being, become a new creature. And through becoming that new creature, we're born again. And I think the Jewish tradition says to everyone who is in pain and who is suffering, you are more than your pain. You are more than your suffering. You're even more than your body. You're a soul that is eternal. Thank you very much. Just kidding. Good evening. <laughs> um, <clears throat> As I understand that uh, I'm supposed to uh, speak here and represent the view of uh, Asian philosophy or spiritual uh, traditions, understanding of uh, what is happiness. 
No, suffering, sorry. <laughs> suffering, yes. <clears throat> so if you still feel that uh, we need more discussion on suffering, so I will add some more. And uh, so, well, like uh, Rabbi said earlier, that uh, it is a huge uh, sort of a treasury of uh, wisdom to cover when you say in the Asian uh, tradition. You know, we have uh, Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, Jain, Jainism, uh, Islam, and so on. There's so many. And so what I have been trained in and also most familiar with is the, <clears throat> the Buddhist uh, tradition. I was trained in Buddhism, Buddhist philosophy, and meditation. And so therefore I will speak mainly from the Buddhist point of view, um, which also in many ways is shared uh, with uh, Hinduism. And also, you know, in, in, for example, where I grew up in India, you know, we have so many religious schools and spiritual traditions, uh, even within India like Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, and so many. You know, I don't know if I can even count. So anyway, I will represent basically mainly from Buddhist tradition and a little bit of Hindu. <clears throat> and so suffering um, in Buddhism or Hinduism, you know, the word for suffering is dukkha. You know, dukkha, dukkha, sorry. It's a little bit soft. Soft, okay. Okay, speak right into the microphone. Okay, let me change this one. I think that's better. Okay. So, is that loud enough? Okay. Or louder? No. Okay. So, the word for suffering is dukkha. Okay, dukkha. It's really interesting because uh, the connotation for this word in Sanskrit, ancient Indian language, uh, does not really translate into what we call suffering, you see. Uh, the word dukkha means disquietude or not at ease or uh, dissatisfaction or a condition of being disturbed. Okay, that's how we sort of understand the word, uh, you know, what we call suffering, okay? And so, in this point of view, the, the primary problem, so to speak, is the, uh, is not really a suffering itself, but the concept of suffering. Right, the concept of suffering, that the label uh, that we give to this uh, experience, you know, which we call dukkha, then we, when we label it and have this uh, concept of suffering, then that actually brings more suffering. That is the problem, basically. And... Uh, um, The spiritual view here is that whether we realize it or not, uh, 
all of our experiences uh, have slight, how do you say, uh, quality, okay, quality or this element of dukkha. This element of dukkha pervades all our experiences, whether we call it suffering or happiness, right? There's the sense of uh, uh, dissatisfaction. There's a sense of sometimes uneasiness, anxiety, or even a, a state of condition being a little bit disturbed. And so therefore, you know, suffering is not seen as a something how do you say, a unique situation or state in our life, you know? It's, it's a kind of funny question to say, do you have suffering <laughs> or I have suffering or not? Because uh, the belief here is that all our experiences have this underlying quality of dukkha to a certain degree, you know? This sense of dissatisfaction, right? And so, therefore, this sense of uh, suffering here is discussed in three different aspects. Uh, there is the sense of uh, suffering of suffering, which we usually call suffering, right? The pain, the physical pain, the mental pain, and in the real sense of uneasiness or disturbed state, and this is what we call the suffering of suffering, uh, which we are mostly discussing about in, let's say, uh, healthcare situation, as well as the spiritual care for um, people in uh, pain and so on. We are mainly dealing with the situation of uh, suffering of suffering. Uh, which is uh, mm, a very wonderful experience, isn't it? And secondly, uh, we have this uh, mm, presentation or understanding that uh, the suffering of change, suffering of change, uh, which we always discuss in the context of, let's say, aging, right? For example, aging. It's a suffering of change. Um, and so the, the Buddhist teaching, and also I think we share with the Hindus, Hindus uh, Hinduism, is that the, the fundamental suffering uh, really is this, this uh, suffering of change, you see. The suffering of change, change that we cannot avoid. Right? The, whether it's a positive change or negative change, it doesn't matter. But whenever there's a change, there's some suffering, there's some pain, there's some uneasiness, there's some anxiety, you know? And that's what we call suffering here again, change. And thirdly, it's a little bit more kind of subtle uh, level of suffering, which we call all-pervasive suffering, all-pervasive. Uh, all pervasive suffering is this uh, sense of a basic heart of dissatisfaction, right? The basic experience of dissatisfaction. Whether, you know, we have uh, $10 in our pocket or a million dollars in our bank account, you know, both guys who have $10 or a million dollars, we both have certain uh, you know, uh, suffering of uh, dissatisfaction. Uh, and so anyway, I won't go into the details of these uh, categories. And so I hope the basic idea of what dukkha is, is clear uh, for us at this point. Uh, it's basically the disquiet, dissatisfaction and so, 
from the mother's point of view, the problem here in the beginning is we have difficulty in accepting the suffering. We go through a lot of denial. Uh, and so the first uh, stage, so to speak, the first point I want to talk about here from the Buddhist point of view is uh, accepting the suffering. You know? Uh, accepting the suffering. Uh, which is basically acknowledging who we are. Right? Acknowledging who we are. We as a, a human being, a sentient being, uh, go through uh, definitely these stages of changes that we can't avoid. You know, each stage of change brings a different uh, experiences of suffering, uh, sickness, illnesses, uh, in the old age, and so on. I've been experiencing wonderful suffering recently from my old age, back pain. Uh, when I first came here to Texas earlier this uh, week, uh, last weekend, uh, I had a really bad, very strong pain. And uh, it's interesting, I want to share this story, that many years ago I was in upstate New York uh, at another conference with the three, uh, again like three speakers, myself presenting the Asian philosophy as usual. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we had one uh, Phenomen, what do you call it? phenomenologist, and then another one really interesting materialist. Uh, I'm sure you all know him. He's pretty uh, well known, Dr. Daniel Dennett. And so we had a very wonderful discussion. And at the end, he told me that he himself does analytical meditation on pain uh, with his. Uh, I think like five-year-old daughter, you know, they practice analytical meditation. And he said it really helps. Uh, it really helps. And uh, one year, I was having a severe um, headache, like the pain that I had this year on my back. And I couldn't get to my Tylenol. I was very irritated. I got the suffering of suffering for not finding my Tylenol right, on top of my headache. Uh, the other suffering was not getting to my Tylenol. And anyway, then I was stuck with a group of people uh, on some meetings, and so I tried to do some meditation, like analytical meditation on pain. It was a really interesting experience, because at that point, when you're stuck with such pain, there's nothing we can do, isn't it? It's something we cannot deny. And so first thing I need to do is to accept that I have such pain. You know, I have such problem, and then to see uh, what I can do with this suffering, right? What I can do with this pain. And so next stage is to see how we can use this pain for something positive. Right? How we can use this pain for something positive. Uh, how we can transform this or discover the usefulness of pain and suffering. And rather than just getting irritated and wishing uh, that we don't have such pain. Right? Of course, we don't want this pain. I mean, I don't want this pain, the back pain. Uh, but that doesn't help. I'm stuck here with the pain, and so must find a way to make useful, something useful of this pain. And this is what we call transformation, transforming our pain. And so, for example, uh, working with the pain of our own, and also working with the pain of other people that we take care of as a healthcare professionals, or as a family member, and how can we make the best uh, use of this situation of our pain? You know, how can we make it a little bit more fun? 
right? Why not? Right? If we have the skills, we can make it turn into turn every situation into something a little bit of a fun, isn't it? Like you know, even religion. <laughs> we don't have to be too serious, uh, you see. <clears throat> and so, therefore, uh, it seems to be um, quite important that we have some understanding of. Uh, um, the usefulness of this pain, how this pain brings, you know, the heart of uh, compassion, love, right? When, uh, when we feel our own pain, then we can feel more sympathy. We can feel more compassion, more love. Oh. Does that mean my time's up or what? I have no clue. Yeah? All right. Okay, sorry. All right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> no. Thank you.